Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we have another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 84th deck and it's titled How Many Lands Are You Running? And if you haven't seen the show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So really quickly, before we get into the actual deck tech, I want to take a couple seconds to highlight some ways that you can help support the channel if that's something you're interested in doing. You can find us over on Twitter at 13POYNZ, Reddit u slash POYNZ13, email dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. All of those are great ways to reach out to us if that's something that, again, you're interested in doing. And if you're looking to support our content a little bit more directly, you can go on over to TCG Player using our affiliate link in the description. And any cards you purchase after clicking on that link lets TCG Player know that we sent you over there, so they give us a little bit of a kickback. And then finally, the most direct way that you can help support us is patreon.com slash dungeonlearnersguide. Over there, you can support us at various tiers, and each of those gives you access to certain benefits we'll say so you could get access to things like the deck lists a week early you could get access to a discord channel where we actually brew up the decks and participate in some of the games if you're interested in being on the channel a little bit and then you also get access to the unedited gameplay videos where you can hear the players commenting over the game and interacting with each other rather than just my own narration Unfortunately, for this video, that is not quite the case. I did forget to record my computer's audio, so it sounds like I'm having an imaginary conversation with three people, so I do apologize for that in advance. However, the last thing you could also get from Patreon is that once a month we will send you one of our random cards of the week, so you will randomly be given a random card, which maybe it'll be a one that you're super interested in, hopefully it will be. But if none of those are your style, you can always just like the video, subscribe to the channel. That does help out quite a bit. And finally, before we move on, I do have to shout out our four current patrons. We have William Swiftfoot, we have Doodle, we have Eric Huey, and Calvin Schmidt. So to the four of you, thank you all so much for all of your support. And without any further ado, let's jump into our deck tech. So first up, we got to talk about the random card of the week. And this one was suggested to us by Doodle over on our Patreon slash Discord. And that card is Earthlink. So Earthlink is three black, red, green for an enchantment. And it says during your upkeep, pay two or bury Earthlink. Whenever a creature is put into the graveyard from play, that creature's controller sacrifices a land. Ignore this effect if that player controls no lands. So a little bit of outdated wording on the card. Obviously, they can't sacrifice a land if they don't have a land. And of course, instead of bury, we would destroy it or sacrifice it. But the main thing that we need to recognize from this card, though is that if our opponent's creatures die, they have to sacrifice a land. This does affect us, so I'm not going to lie, we're not playing a ton of creatures. That's kind of our game plan. But if we can destroy our opponent's things, we can not only turn our removal spells into, you know, a removal spell of killing their creatures, but it also makes them sacrifice a land. So that can be incredibly useful and very dangerous for decks that want to go wide, because if we happen to wipe the board, they're kind of out of luck. So a good commander for us to build around for this deck was a bit tricky. I couldn't quite think of something that I wanted to use until I ran into Daragaz Reincarnated. So Daragaz is four black, red, green for a 7-7 seven, seven legendary creature dragon. It's got flying, trample, and haste. If Daragaz would die, instead exile it with three egg counters on it. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if Daragaz is exiled with an egg counter on it, remove an egg counter from it. Then if Daragaz has no egg counters on it, return it to the battlefield. So it kind of gives it a weird version of suspend with egg counters instead of time counters. But basically, if we ever lose Daragaz, as long as it's not exiled or bounced to our hand, we can just replay it again in three turns. It'll come back 7-7 seven, seven, flying trample haste, immediately start attacking, immediately start doing damage. And so you might notice that we're not going to have a ton of creatures. We have our commander that we don't really have to recast and there's a chance that we're destroying lands. So before all the questions come up, yes, this is a land destruction deck. So when we start talking about our themes, for example, the first theme that we're going to have to talk about 
is land destruction. And specifically, I wanted to focus on non-basic land destruction because I've noticed that a lot of times my opponents are playing way too many non-basics, and I thought this might be kind of a fun direction to take it. So we have things like Destructive Flow, which is black, red, green for an enchantment. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a non-basic land. In our deck, we are running very, very few non-basic lands. In fact, almost all of our non-basic lands can sacrifice themselves to get other lands because we want to try to make sure that we have the right colors that we need, but at the same time, we're running as many basic lands as possible. So that way, we don't get hit by destructive flow while hopefully all of our opponents do. And on the off chance that we hit one of our cards that destroys all lands, not just all non-basic lands, we want to make sure that we're benefiting from that too, and that is where our theme of, well, our destroying our own lands comes in, I suppose. I don't know how else to phrase that, but we have things like Titania, Protector of Argoth, which is three green green for a 5-3 legendary creature elemental. When Titania, Protector of Argoth, enters the battlefield, return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So if any of our lands get destroyed, we can bring them back with Titania. And whenever a land you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 5-3 green elemental creature token. That is also incredibly useful because, unfortunately, it's not going to work super well with Earthlink because if they kill a token, then we sack a land, we make another token, they kill that, we can just kind of cycle through our lands and we don't really want that, but... Titania is going to be great for all of our lands that sacrifice themselves to search out other lands, and she's going to be great if we happen to destroy all lands with her on the board. Because if we destroy all lands, we just make an army of 5-3 elementals, and hopefully at that point, our opponents, without their lands, can't do much to stop us. So Titania is a great example of what we want to be doing and ways that we want to benefit from land destruction in ways that our opponents won't be able to. And then finally, our last theme ties back into Earthlink a little bit. That is mass creature removal. Because Earthlink wants to get rid of people's lands when their creatures die, what better way to wipe away all their lands than to just wipe away all their creatures at the same time? So we have things like Deadly Tempest, which is four black black for a sorcery. It says destroy all creatures. Each player loses life equal to the number of creatures they controlled that were destroyed this way. So if our opponents have, we'll say, five creatures each, they all lose five creatures and lose five life. Ideally, we'll also have Earthlink, or there are a few other cards that do the exact same thing Earthlink does. Those are also in this deck. They would lose five creatures, lose five life, and lose five lands. If we run into a token strategy that's going wide, they have a ton of creatures, just a simple board wipe could pretty much knock a player out of the game, whether it's actually knocking them out because they're losing all the life or because they're losing all their lands. Either way is fine with us. So this is what we're trying to do with this deck. And I know it doesn't sound like a very nice deck. I feel like very recently we've been going through a couple of not so nice decks, but we want to destroy some lands. We want to benefit from our lands being destroyed and we want to destroy our opponent's creatures. We want to make sure that at the end of the game, we essentially have a flawless victory. We have a board and nobody else does. That is the end game. So to that end, we of course have some key cards in this deck, some things that are going to help us get to that end game either as quickly as possible or as efficiently as possible. Whether they actually win us the game or not, they're at least pushing us toward a win. So the first card that I want to talk about is Centaur Vinecrasher, and this is a personal favorite of mine. I feel like I put this in a lot of decks, even when I probably shouldn't, but Centaur Vinecrasher is three and a green for a 1-1 one, one plant centaur. It's got trample. And Centaur Vinecrasher enters the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it, equal to the number of land cards in all graveyards. Plus, whenever a land card is put into a graveyard from anywhere, note this doesn't say it has to be our land, we may pay green green. If you do, return Centaur Vinecrasher from your graveyard to your hand. So, if things work out well, we could maybe destroy just three lands per player, right? It's a four-player game. Each person destroys three lands over the course of the game. We cast Centaur Vinecrasher. There are 12 lands in graveyards. It is now a 13-13 
with trample that we could recur if more lands get destroyed. So it's a shame it doesn't have haste, but just having a massive beater with trample sometimes is all you need, especially when, and I'm going to keep saying this throughout the course of the video, I feel like, but especially when your opponents don't have lands to interact with what you're doing. If we can continuously destroy our opponent's lands, this will not only, well, I was going to say get bigger. It doesn't get bigger once it's hit play, but if we have to recast it, then it will get bigger. So it'll get bigger over the course of the game. But if our opponents don't have lands, then they can't really kill it. So we have a great way to end the game after blowing up the board, which is something that a lot of people complain about when you're talking land destruction. People don't like having their lands destroyed and then having to sit around until they're eventually killed. This speeds up the process. And that then leads us into our second key card, which is a good way to destroy all the lands. That is Jokel Hops. And I'm not 100% sure if I'm saying that right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but Jokel Hops is four red red for a sorcery that just says destroy all artifacts, creatures, and lands. And this is exactly what we want to be doing, because if we combine this with something like Titania, Titania would trigger after all the lands, artifacts, and creatures are destroyed, making us an army of elementals. And at that point, nobody else has anything on board, so there's nothing they can do. There's also a world where maybe we ramp a little bit, we have a ton of lands, and we're able to float all of our mana. Say we have 10 mana, we cast Jokel Hops, destroy everything, and with the 4 mana left over, we cast Centaur Vine Crasher, which is now massive because nobody has any lands, they're all in the graveyard. And then that Centaur Vine Crasher can just kind of start knocking people out of the game. So Jokel Hops is amazing at what we really want it to be doing, and the key part of this is that it doesn't destroy enchantments. So if we have something like Earthlink on board, we can not only destroy all creatures, artifacts, and lands, but we can kind of prevent anyone from doing anything else from that point on, because no matter what they do, we might have enchantments that are preventing them from playing lands, preventing them from casting creatures, or forcing them to take damage if they play a land or cast a creature. So. Jokel Hops really does everything we want to do in a nice little package. It is, however, probably going to make the people at the table pretty salty, so be aware that you don't want to cast this unless you have a way to win the game from it, because otherwise you're just prolonging the game and then everyone kind of gangs up on you. So be aware of that. And finally, leading into our final key card of the deck, Tainted Aether. And this is a card that I didn't actually know existed before I built this deck. And now that I know it exists, I'm probably going to put it in quite a few more decks just because I like the way that it plays out. But Tainted Aether is two black black for an enchantment, so it doesn't get destroyed by Jokel Hops. Whenever a creature comes into play, its controller sacrifices a creature or land. So if you are a ramp deck, you're playing a ton of lands, you have way more lands than your opponents do, this isn't a problem. You can sacrifice a land, no issue. If you're a token deck, that might be a bit of a problem because you need your creatures in play, but you also need your lands in play. And if you're just playing one big haymaker a turn, like a big dragon or a big angel or something, this also probably isn't going to be the end of the world because you can sacrifice a land and play another one next turn. But for the decks that really kind of run in the middle, they want to have a bunch of lands, but also a bunch of creatures this gets very complicated and it forces people to make some difficult decisions because they don't want to have to sacrifice their creatures, but they don't want to have to sacrifice their lands. And a lot of times people just might not play creatures to avoid having this happen to them. So whether they're playing creatures and sacrificing lands, playing creatures and sacrificing creatures, or just not playing creatures, that's all a win for us because no matter what we are doing, we don't mind our lands being sacrificed. We don't mind having more lands that go to the graveyard. We have a ton of stuff that benefits us for that. So Tainted Aether works perfectly in this deck. And yes, it's a bit expensive. It's about $7, but I do think it's a phenomenal include because there are some decks that honestly just won't be able to beat it. But those are our key cards for this week. So the next thing we got to do is take a look at some cool interactions, some cards that synergize very well together. And while they may not necessarily be like a, an infinite combo, win the game type combination, they're still very strong together. And the first cool interaction that I want to highlight is between Wave of Vitriol and Zozu the Punisher. So 
Wave of Vitriol, 5 green green for a sorcery. Each player sacrifices all artifacts, enchantments, and non-basic lands they control. So again, that non-basic land hate. And for each land sacrificed this way, its controller may search their library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then each player who searched their library this way shuffles it. Since we don't really have any non-basic lands, this isn't an issue for us. Now, obviously, it will destroy our artifacts, it will destroy our enchantments, but that's not the end of the world when it's also getting rid of our opponent's artifacts and enchantments. However, this really shines against the decks that are, you know, three, four, five colors and have a ton of non-basic lands, and especially if we have Zozu the Punisher on board, because Zozu the Punisher is one red red for a legendary creature, Goblin Warrior, it's a 2-2. Two, two. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, Zozu the Punisher deals two damage to that land's controller. So the way this works out is, yeah, Wave of Vitriol destroys all the non-basic lands, but then it gives our opponents a choice. Do they either search their library and put basic lands into play, taking two damage for each of them from Zozu, or do they just let the lands go away and not replace them so they don't have to take the damage from Zozu? This is, again, a win for us either way, because either they're taking a ton of damage from Zozu or they're not getting any lands. And at that point, if they're especially if they're something like a five color deck, there might not be much they can do. So there's a very good chance we can put our opponents into a situation where they're almost forced to get some basic lands, being forced to take the damage from Zozu. And then there's a solid chance that we can just kind of start to win the game from there because they'll have to rebuild, they'll have to try to recast things, they'll start triggering all the rest of our effects. So Wave of Vitriol and Zozu are a great combination because whether our opponents get the lands or not, we kind of win in the end. And then our next cool interaction we got to talk about is a little bit different than this one. It is going to be between Boom, Bust, and the Mending of Dominaria. So Boom, Bust, well, let's flip that one so we can actually read it. So Boom is one and a red for a sorcery that says destroy target land you control and target land you don't control. Typically, we're not going to really want to be casting that one. It feels bad to spend two mana to destroy our own land and someone else's. However, Bust is five and a red for a sorcery destroy all lands. That is what we want to be doing. Six mana to get rid of all lands, perfect. Now, the best thing we can do with this, though, is combine it with the Mending of Dominaria, which is three green green for a saga. Uh, and it says when it comes in and when you put another lore counter on it, so for steps one and for steps two, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And then in step three, Return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield, then shuffle your graveyard into your library. So if we cast the Mending of Dominaria and we're on step one or step two, we can then cast Bust to destroy all lands. The Mending of Dominaria sits on the board, eventually hits step three, and returns all of our lands from the graveyard to the battlefield, but not our opponent's lands. So this puts us in a huge lead because now we can still cast our spells. We've shuffled our graveyard back in, so at some point we might actually be able to cast Bust again if our opponents start getting a ton of lands. We can keep casting things like our Commander, Zozu, any more removal spells, this puts us so far ahead of our opponents that it makes it next to impossible for them to win. Because unless they're able to stop the Mending of Dominaria, we're able to just keep playing the game but ruin everybody else's board states. So this can be incredibly powerful. Again, something to be aware of when destroying your opponent's lands in general is you want to try to make sure you can win because if not then the rest of the table is going to try to gang up on you might get a little bit upset so something to be aware of but that leads us to the end of our actual deck tech the last thing we've got to do since this is a budget show is take a look at the price of the deck and this week the deck came in at 97 dollars 62 so pretty close to our 100 dollars budget limit and the most expensive card in the deck is actually Ruination, which is three and a red for a sorcery that says destroy all non-basic lands, and it's $8.48. So most of the time when we put together our budget for this 
show, we have cards that are, you know, 10 to $15 that is like our most expensive card. And then a lot of our other cards fall a lot cheaper. For this deck, we had a lot of cards fall between that 5 to $8 range, so it's very difficult to suggest cutting just one card for the price, because if you cut Ruination for budget reasons, it still only drops you down to about $89, which is cheaper, don't get me wrong, but it's not a lot cheaper. So this deck is actually really difficult to suggest cutting specific cards. However, if you can only cut one card or you only want to cut one card, Ruination is the most expensive, and we do have other effects that do a similar thing. Granted, they are much more expensive, like Wave of Vitriol being 7 mana as opposed to Ruination being 4. So that is something to consider. On the other hand, I do have one suggestion for you if you're looking for cards that are out of the budget that we couldn't quite fit into this deck. Since we were only $3 under budget, there's a $7 card I wanted to put in, but just couldn't. So my suggestion to you is if you're able to, put in Price of Glory and take out Wayfarer's Bauble. So Price of Glory, two and a red for an enchantment. Whenever a player taps a land for mana during another player's turn, destroy that land. This is exactly what we want to be doing. Because we're a Jund deck, we're red, black, and green, we don't have a ton of instant speed interaction, and the instant speed interaction that we do have tends to be removal spells. So we can cast the removal spells on our turn and not really have to worry too much about what our opponents are doing. This really shuts down things like blue decks. If anyone has counter spells or any combat tricks that they want to play during someone else's turn, this forces them to make the hard choice of do you cast that combat trick or do you cast that counter spell or do you sacrifice a ton of lands? So this can be incredibly tricky and it's a nice little mind game to throw into the works and still plays into our sacrificing lands strategy or destroying lands strategy. Now, the reason I would suggest replacing Wayfarer's Bauble for this is because we're, well, a Jund deck. We're green, mostly green, red, and black, which means that we have a ton of ways to put lands into play, and Wayfarer's Bauble is just not very efficient. It's three mana to be able to put one land into play. We also run things like Cultivate, which is three mana to put one land into play and put another land into our hand. So if we can, we would rather have those effects. And Wayfarer's Bauble, while very good, is more out of place in a Jund deck than you might expect because we just have better options for land ramp. So it's not a bad card by any means, but I think because we have so much green in the deck, we're kind of better off putting in Price of Glory if that's something that our budget can afford. So... That is the end of our deck tech overall. The last thing we're going to have to do for this video, beyond the deck tech of course, is see how this deck performs in a game. We are going to run this deck up against three opponents, see how it works, see if it functions the way that we hope it does, and hopefully, at the end of the day, come away with a win. So, our opponents this week... We are being joined by Bilal, playing Shanid Sleeper's Scourge. I think that's how you pronounce that. Again, I'm not great at pronunciation, so if I pronounce it wrong, please let me know. We have Sean playing the Ur-Dragon, and we have Jason playing Millicent Restless Revenant. So first up, Bilal and Shanid. This is a Legendary Matters deck, so he's got as many Legendaries as possible. He's got legendary lands and legendary creatures and enchantments and all of that stuff. So as much legendary permanence or as many legendary permanents, I suppose, as he could fit into the deck, they are there. So he wants to draw a ton of cards, play a bunch of big creatures, play a bunch of planeswalkers, and just kind of outvalue his opponents with his card draw. I'm not going to lie, I am a little worried about this one, but my hope is because he's playing a lot of legendary lands, he's not going to have a ton of basic lands for when we start destroying lands, and things like our non-basic land destruction are really going to shut him down in the long run. Next up, we have Sean in his Ur-Dragon deck. A very similar thought process in my head is that he's probably not going to be running a ton of basics. However, I do know that a lot of dragons tend to be red, so I wouldn't be surprised if he has a ton of mountains and not a ton of other lands. So that is something to be afraid of. And I think overall, this is probably the deck I'm the most afraid of because he's the deck that's playing just that one massive creature every single turn. So 
it's not like we're going to be able to wipe his board and destroy all his lands. If we wipe his board, we might destroy one, two lands, and then he just plays another dragon and keeps beating us down. So that is my big concern coming from the Ur-Dragon, at least from our point of view, but we'll see how the game goes. And then finally, we have Jason and his Millicent deck. Uh, this is a deck that he's played on the channel before. It's a very sweet deck. Personally, I'm a big fan of Spirits. I think that they're super cool. But I think that this is one of those decks that we can do very well against because he wants to make a ton of little Spirit tokens. And if we happen to get Earthlink down and then Wrath his board, he's just done because he's not going to have any lands. There's not much he's going to be able to do. But I think that having defenses is going to be our tough part against Millicent because we don't play a ton of creatures because we don't want to fall into the Earthlink trap ourselves. So there's a good chance that we just can't put up enough blockers to stop an army of spirits before we're able to rat the board. Overall, though, I am very excited for this game. I think it's going to lead to some unique challenges for our deck, but I do think it's going to be a good time overall. So I hope you all enjoy it as well, and I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the game, I go first, followed by Bilal, Sean, and then Jason. On my first turn, I play a forest. Bilal plays a mana confluence and casts Yoshimaru Ever Faithful, which gets a plus one plus one counter whenever another legendary permanent enters the battlefield under his control. Sean plays a Vivid Grove, entering with two charge counters on it. Jason plays a Port Town. I play a mountain and cast Farseek, searching my library for a swamp, putting it into play tapped. Bilal plays Hawkins National Laboratory, putting a counter on Yoshimaru, and then casts Orzhov's Signet. Sean plays a mountain and casts Dragon Lord's Servant, making all his dragons cost one less to cast. Jason plays an island and casts Dorothea Vengeful Victim, which has to be sacrificed at the end of combat whenever she attacks or blocks. I play a mountain and cast Swift Foot Boots. Bilal plays Iganjo, Seat of the Empire, putting a counter on Yoshimaru, and then casts his commander Shanid, Sleeper's Scourge, giving his other legendary creatures menace and letting him draw a card and lose a life whenever he casts a legendary spell or plays a legendary land. Sean plays a Plains and passes. Jason plays a Plains and attacks me for 4, sacrificing Dorothea at the end of combat, and then in his second main phase, casts Mischievous Catgeist, drawing a card when it deals combat damage to a player. On my turn, I play a Mountain and pass. Bilal plays a Caves of Koilos and casts Dehada Binder of Wills, putting a counter on Yoshimaru, drawing a card, and losing a life. He then activates Tahada's plus 2 ability, giving Yoshimaru Vigilance, Lifelink, and Indestructible until his next turn, and then attacks me with Yoshimaru for 5, gaining 5 life. Sean plays a Mountain and casts Crucible of Fire, giving all his dragons plus 3 plus 3. Jason plays an Island, and then moves to combat, attacking me with the Cat Geist for 1, drawing a card. Then, in his second main phase, he casts Skyclave Apparition, exiling Shanid when it enters the battlefield. Then, at the end of turn, I cast Windgrace's Judgment, letting me destroy one non-land permanent for each of my opponents, and this has me destroying Dehada, Crucible of Fire, and Mischievous Catgeist. Unfortunately though, on my turn, I do nothing and pass. Bilal cast Ellis Il Kor, Sadistic Pilgrim, putting a counter on Yoshimaru and also being able to gain a life when a creature enters under his control and make each opponent lose a life whenever one of his creatures dies. He then attacks Jason for 6 and passes. Sean plays a Mountain and casts Karthus Tyrant of Jund, gaining control of all dragons and giving all his dragons haste. He then attacks me for 7 since I destroyed his enchantment, but before damage, I cast Putrefy to destroy the dragon, taking no damage. Jason casts a Ghostly Pilferer, drawing a card whenever an opponent casts a spell from somewhere other than their hand, and then attacks Sean for 2, but Sean calls the bluff and blocks with his 1-3, taking no damage. On my turn I cast Harrow, sacrificing a mountain to search my library for two basic lands, putting them into play, and then cast Tainted Aether, forcing each player to sacrifice either a land or a creature whenever a creature enters the battlefield under their control. On Bilal's turn, he immediately goes to combat, attacking me for 6, and then passes. 
Sean plays a mountain and casts Teneb the Harvester, sacrificing a mountain when it enters, and then attacks me for one with the Servant. Jason casts his commander Millicent, Restless Revenant, sacrificing an island and allowing him to make a 1-1 spirit token whenever one of his non-token spirits dies or deals combat damage to a player. He then attacks me for 4, making two spirit tokens, but sacrificing both of them to Tainted Aether. Then in his second main phase, he plays an island and passes. I cast Nightshade Harvester, putting a counter on it and making an opponent lose a life whenever that opponent plays a land, also sacrificing a forest when it enters. Then I equip the Harvester with Swiftfoot Boots, giving it haste and hexproof, and at the end of turn, Bilal activates Hawkins National Laboratory, making a clue token. On Bilal's turn, he attacks me for 6 with Yoshimaru, and then sacrifices a clue to draw a card. Sean plays a Crucible of the Spirit Dragon, losing a life while I put a counter on Nightshade Harvester. Sean then activates the Crucible, putting a storage counter on it, and passes. Jason plays a Plains, losing a life and putting a counter on the Harvester, and then casts Cat-like Curiosity from the Graveyard, enchanting Millicent, letting him draw a card whenever she deals combat damage to a player. He then attacks Bilal for 4, drawing a card and making a Spirit Token, which makes him sacrifice an island. In his second main phase, he sacrifices Myriad Landscape, searching his library for two basic lands, putting them into play tapped. This has him losing two life while I put two counters on Nightshade Harvester. On my turn, I simply play a Swamp and pass. Bilal plays Iganjo Castle, putting a counter on Yoshimaru, losing a life, and putting a counter on the Harvester. Sean plays a Mountain, losing a life, putting another counter on the Harvester, and then attacks Bilal for six with Teneb, but before damage, Bilal casts a Swords to Plowshares, exiling the dragon but gaining Sean's 6 life. Jason plays a Plains, losing a life and putting a counter on the Harvester, and then attacks Sean for 4 with Millicent, drawing a card and creating a Spirit, but sacrificing the Spirit to Tainted Aether. Then in his second main phase, he casts Benevolent Offering, allowing himself and Bilal to each make 3 Spirit tokens, while Jason and I gain 2 life for each creature we control. This results in Bilal and Jason sacrificing all three spirits, and then I gain two life while Jason gains eight. He then casts Cemetery Illuminator, sacrificing his spirit token when it enters, and exiling Karthus from Sean's graveyard. This lets him look at and cast spells from the top of his library as long as they're creature spells. On my turn, I play a forest, and then cast my commander Daragaz Reincarnated, sacrificing a swamp when he enters. Bilal plays a Rugged Prairie, losing a life and putting a counter on the Harvester, and then attacks Jason for 6, but he blocks with the Ghostly Pilferer, killing it and making a Spirit Token, which is then sacrificed to Tainted Aether. Then in Bilal's second main phase, he overloads Dam, destroying all creatures. This makes several Spirit Tokens, but all but one are sacrificed to Tainted Aether when they enter. Notably, this also exiles Daragaz with 3 Egg Counters. On Sean's turn, he casts Scion of the Ur Dragon, sacrificing a mountain when it enters. Then on Jason's turn, he plays a Command Tower and attacks me for one. In Jason's second main phase, he casts Darksteel Mutation to turn Scion of the Ur Dragon into a 0 1 indestructible insect, but in response, Sean activates Scion, searching his library for a dragon and putting it into his graveyard, turning Scion into a copy of the Chosen Dragon. This lets him get Salumgar the Drifting Death, which has hexproof, fizzling Jason's spell. Then Jason casts Timon, Youthful Geist, letting him tap a creature each combat and also searching his deck for Rhoda, Geist Avenger, putting it into his hand. On my turn, I cast Jokel Hops, destroying all creatures, lands, and artifacts. Once that resolves, knowing Daragaz can come back in two turns, everyone decides to concede rather than wait out the dragon, winning me the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. Definitely showed the power of land destruction. I mean, in all honesty, we played one mass land destruction deck and everybody at the table scooped because we had Daragaz. So definitely very powerful. It is nice to see that 
just having the win condition made the entire difference in the game. I don't think our opponents would have scooped if we hadn't had our commander. It is worth noting, though, that because we still had the Tainted Aether on board, if I weren't able to play a land before Daragaz returned, I would have had to sacrifice Daragaz to the Tainted Aether. Luckily, I did have a land in my top two cards, so that wouldn't have been an issue, but that is something to be aware of if this is ever a situation that you find yourself in if you decide to play this deck. Otherwise, I think everyone's decks really performed very well. I think Millicent probably in the long run would have been the deck to win if I hadn't wrath the board. Well, I say wrath the board. If we hadn't destroyed all the lands, killed all the creatures, you know, Jokel hops things. But the fact that he was able to keep kind of recurring spirit tokens and being able to play a ton of creatures and get a ton of card draw, I think Jason's deck probably would have won in the long run. Um, Bilal's deck also did very well. He was able to get Yoshimaru down very quickly and just kind of keep swinging in at people and getting a ton of counters and drawing a ton of cards with his commander. So also very cool. I think that if he had had a couple more turns or had not been affected as much by the Tainted Aether, I think Bilal's deck also could have done very well. And I wouldn't have been surprised if his had wound up winning either. And then finally, uh, Sean's deck really got hit harder than I expected by removal spells and just being able to keep one thing off of the board every single turn and i think sean really wasn't falling for bluffs much in this game he blocked one of jason's creatures when he probably shouldn't have calling his bluff he swung into me after i declared that i had a removal spell for his uh Karthus and got it removed he swung into Bilal when Bilal said he had a removal spell so Sean was very much just not taking it in this game. He was ready to start swinging dragons at people, and unfortunately, every single time he did, he ran into a removal spell, which is not where you want to be with dragons because they're just so expensive and so hard to get into play. So I think if it weren't for that, I do think dragons could have done something very powerful and very incredible, but unfortunately, the removal spells kind of kept him at bay. So overall a very fun game um obviously fun from my point of view because i didn't have all my lands destroyed and have nothing to do but you never know so hope you all enjoyed it as well i hope the deck performed up to expectations i hope that you got some tips out of this if you're looking into your own land destruction deck but as always please do like the video subscribe to the channel and i will see you all on the other side of the dungeon learners guide